Hello everyone, my name is Naren and in this session, let's learn system design for Dropbox or you know Google Drive or any of the file sharing and upload services. And here are the features which we want to support for uh, this, this particular design. So users should be able to upload and download the files which is there in the sync folder or he should be able to upload a single file and download the single file also. Along with that, he should be able to delete, should be able to update and also you should be able to, you know, kind of write, rewrite and all this kind of operations. Along with that, the very important feature is like history of the updates. So what he needs to do is he also wants to look at the history of the updates to the file. Say, for example, if he has a file of text file and he's, he had made up you know, a lot of updates to that file, he wants to see what, what was the last update I made, you know, one week before or one day before or what is the latest update as such. So these are the main features which I want to support. Along with that, maybe we also want to support API integrations for our services. Say, for example, if I want to have an API using that API, I can upload and download the services, um, such kind of services. So my idea for now is I'm not going to talk a lot about web kind of services where in Google Drive, right? You can use web services and upload and download. So it just increases the complexity of the system design. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to think of, you know, there is a client, okay, in which there are a lot of services and using that client, like a sync uh, client in which uh, the, the client which you're going to install on your desktop or your mobile phone as such. And the client is always looking into a particular folder that is a sync folder or number of folders and in which it is always uh, is kind of monitoring the changes to the file and it uploads. That's what the whole idea of the system design of Dropbox or Drive or any file sharing service for today. So now let's talk about the scale of the service which I want to, you know, which we are planning to design today. So I actually don't know the Google Drive uh, number of users. It could be enormous, but I'm going to just take the numbers which I got it from the, you know, Dropbox, okay? So, so far they have about 10 plus million users, unique users, and about 100 million requests are happening per day and they have a lot of you know writes and reads happening to their system. So writes in in the sense even it includes the updates and new files uploading and reads as in so it, it's just like downloading or just viewing the file using their services. And uh, here is the system design um, diagram over here. So you just saw the Dropbox system design diagram, right? So it is full of complex components in it. So before I explain all of these components individually, I want to tell you something exciting, or I want to actually convince you guys or explain you guys what is the core problem in file uploading and downloading services. Because there are a lot of assumptions uh, about designing the Dropbox, like whenever I talk to people, like how do you design, you know, Dropbox like services, what they say is all you need to use is some cloud services and then you just upload the file and download the file whenever you want. And that's simple, right? Because that's not how it works. The problem is very uh, kind of different problem. So I'm going to explain all of that and tell you exactly what problem and how we are going to solve that. So to explain that, so consider this is you and you have a file Say, for example, this file size is about two, sorry, 20 MB. So let's consider that the file size is 20 MB. And this is a big, enormous you know, text file where you have a lot of text content inside it. So now for the first time, okay, you don't have any service as such. You have a file, you have a cloud service, say it is Amazon S3 or something. And um, very important thing is in this session, we are not going to talk about how do we actually build those, you know, cloud, um, file storage or something like that. Let's go ahead and use Amazon S3 or any Azure services which just keeps the file in the cloud and it scales um, like uh, anything and uh, we don't care about it. So we, in this session, let's concentrate only on how we build the you know, Dropbox, Dropbox-like services and we don't concentrate on how to be build the cloud storage. We just put the file or blog or anything into the cloud service and, and the files will be saved and whenever we want, we can retrieve it back, okay? So now it is S3 or something, okay, fine. Now we have only three components, that is you, the file and the cloud. So now for the first time you have the file which is of 20 MB, 
Now you want to share or upload it to the cloud. What you do is you take this file, upload it into the cloud, and you have that file over here of 20 MB. Okay, now all good. Now you get a unique link to this URL or something you share with your friends or something like that. Now, the next time you might want to update this file, two things might happen. One thing is you might have the file locally, or if you don't have the file, you will download it back to the, I know, your laptop or something and you edit it. Once you edit it, you also want to upload it back to the cloud so that you can share it again or you know save it into the cloud. So now what do, you know, what do I do is upload it again, thinking that I have a local copy and then I upload it again. Fine, we might do two things on the cloud service. One thing is we might overwrite the already existing file or we might create one more copy of the file. Now consider we want to support the historical, we also need to know what was the historical updates to the file. So let's keep a copy of the file. So the second file, the version two and version one, that is also of 20 and we will be uploaded to the cloud. Now carefully observe, when the first time we updated or uploaded to the cloud services, we use 20 MB bandwidth. And the second time also we use 20 MB bandwidth, right? So total 40 MB bandwidth utilization. And in the cloud storage, we are consuming almost like 40 MB storage. And if I do one more update, I will upload it once again. Now again, I'll consider, you know, I'll use or consume 20 MB bandwidth. And I will create one more copy of the file that is third version of 20, 20 MB again. Now, do you see some problem over here? I don't know whether you guys see it or not, but let me explain. See the bandwidth consumption. For the 20 MB file, for the three time update, even when we update a little bit, you know, just one character correction, or even if it is a big correction, we almost consumed about 60 MB of the bandwidth. And in the cloud also, just to keep a copy of the files or historical review, you know, uh, versions of the file, we consume about 60 MB, MB of the file. And this cloud is costlier, right? And also, you need to pay dollars to every MB you are saving in the cloud service. And also, we are consuming the bandwidth. What if this was about 2 GB file? How much time does it take to upload the 2 GB file and download the 2 GB file? It's, it at least take too much of time to upload and download. And also, if it was a 2 GB file, we would have easily consumed about 6 GB of bandwidth and also 6 GB of cloud storage over here. Now, given this problem, let's see what are the problems listed here. So the first one is upload or concurrency. Now, what happens is, say you try to automate the process of upload and download. Now consider you wrote a Python service, dot .py service, which kind of monitors the changes to this file and uploads automatically. Now what this Python file will do is, it, what it can do is it looks at the file as a whole and then and whenever you click a button to sync, the whole file will be uploaded to the cloud and that's what it does. Okay. Now what it does is it has to take the whole file and upload it into the cloud. So if you closely observe, it is kind of taking the whole file and uploading it. So I can write a script with having, you know, multi-threaded or multi-process um, like um, in a threaded operation to sync the file so that the operation is faster. Can I do that? Now we can't actually do that because it's a whole file. I can't just write a script which is multi-threaded to just upload one file. It's kind of difficult, very difficult, right? And that's the concurrency problem. You can't actually make use of the concurrency uh, to upload the files to make the upload operation or download operation much faster. And that's one problem, okay? And now let's come to the latency. So if it was about uh, 20 MB, consider like um, to upload one MB of the file, it is taking one second. Now if we have to wait about 20 seconds to upload or even we have to wait 20 seconds to download, we can't do optimization on that because the whole file is uploaded, all for the file is downloaded. We can't just do any opti optimization there. And also related to the bandwidth, so how much bandwidth it is consuming? Every time when I, even if I just edit one character in the file, I, I'm actually, you know, uploading about 20 MB of the file um, to the cloud. And also I'm saving 20 MB of the cloud storage 
that is um, the storage full problem. Uh, just to keep the different history or the version of the file, I have to keep the whole copy of the file just because we edited one character in this 20 MB file. So this is kind of totally a bad idea. This is what we initially think when we want to design file upload or sharing services. So now let's sit back, relax, and design in a different way where all of these kind of problems are solved. But what do we do? So what we can actually do is, instead of rethinking the file as a whole one, yeah. instead of rethinking the whole file as one entity, let's think differently. What we do is, let's break this file into multiple chunks. Say, this 20 MB file, right? 20 MB file. I'm going to break it into, say, 10 different pieces. What I do is, I'm going to break this file into 10 different pieces. Okay. Now I have broken this file into 10 different pieces. Now I call this each of these pieces into chains. So there is first chain, second tree, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. There are 10 chains, and each chain is obviously 2 MB in size. Fine. Let's revise the whole scenario which we just discussed. So now the for, for the very first time, I have a text file of 20 MB. Now we want to upload. Obviously, for the very first time, if I'm uploading to the cloud storage, I'll have to upload all of these chunks to the cloud. It will take 20 MB of the bandwidth and 20 MB of the storage. So I'm going to write it somewhere here. So the version 1, 20 MB. Obvious, right? It took 20 MB of the file storage. Now all good. Now the fun part is, now I just updated one character in the file, in the chunk number five or in the, in the position where there's chunk number five. So now I want to sync the file to the cloud. What do I need to do? Instead of uploading all of the file to the cloud, I just need to sync this fifth chunk only because that's where the update has happened. Now, if I want to sync this, what is the size of the chunk? I'm going to just sync this chunk that is of 2 MB only. And in here, instead of keeping the whole file, I'm just going to save just 2 MB chunk and I mark it as second version 5. How cool is that? We just consumed 22 MB of the cloud storage. In the bandwidth also, we just consume 22 MB only. And now, the very first problem, right? Concurrency problem. How do we solve that? Consider I wrote a Python script dot py, okay? This surveys, what it does is, say have about five threads in it, and each thread can take a chunk and upload it. So as I already mentioned, if we are taking about one second to upload one MB, then obviously earlier we used to take about 20 seconds, right? Now, how much time does it take? It will just take, to sync the whole file, we just take 20 seconds divided by five times, almost like about four seconds only. Earlier we used to take 20 seconds, now we are just taking four seconds. And um, so this is, that's what the optimization. So the latency is very less because we can sync the chunks parallelly to the cloud, okay? And here, instead of actually saving the whole file, we are kind of actually saving the chunks. The very first file, which I have written here, it's not the whole file. It will be like 10 different chunks of the files, which is saved in the cloud. And in the second time, we only have one chunk. In the third time, maybe if I edit this particular part and this particular part, now I just need to sync these two chunks only. Now in this uh, update, we only got, you know, use four MB of uh, kind of, of four MB of bandwidth. And also in the third version, we only keep these chunks 2 MB, 2 MB, okay, of these two chains which was updated. Now think that you have one more mobile devices where you want to keep on syncing this file there. Now there also the bandwidth consumption will be almost equal to this much. In earlier case, it would have been like three times the file will be synced. It will be like about 60 you know, MB of the file, you know, bandwidth utilization to your mobile device. But in this case, it just consumes about 26 MB only. And you can, in mobile device also, you can just now use concurrency to download these chains so there will be a faster sync in the operation. So this is the um, radical approach which will help us to design you know, next generation 
fast service, fast file sharing and upload service. And now you might be thinking, now somehow we divided this file into chunks. Now who tracks all of these chunks? How do I know what chunk belongs to what file as such? So now I just explained you with one file. If I had about 10, 15 files, there will be like chunks all over uh, the cloud, right? So how do we know that? To solve that problem, what we need to do is we need to have one more file that is called as metadata file. What this file contains is this chunk information. Maybe we take a hash of the chunk and we mention all of the hashes, 10 different hashes, and maybe their locations or something like some reference to this chunk should be there. Some reference to the chunk should be there in this metadata file. And this metadata file also can be synced into the cloud metadata file and that metadata file can be downloaded whenever we want or that also saved there. Basically, metadata file gives you the indexes to all the chunks of the file so that we can download all of the chunks. Even when we are downloading, we can actually use concurrency so that we can download the file faster and we can stitch back all of these chunks to get a complete file using this metadata file. Okay, so this is the very core or important part which you guys need to understand in designing, um, you know, any of the file um, uploading or downloading services. And this way, it um, we can solve all of these kind of problems. So one such services um, is like HDFS, right? Even HDFS deals with you know gigabytes or petabytes of the file, and it, it actually does the same thing. It actually um, um, divides the file into 64 MB chunks and, in, and it distributes the file in different, different machines so that it, uh, it can give the backup you know, of the files and duplicate, it can save the duplicate copy of the file easily. So even in, in this case also, if you want to distribute across different uh, machines um, and everything, it will be much easier to play with the chunks instead of one whole file. And that thing will actually happen inside the cloud and that actually will be taken care by Amazon S3. And it will be much easier for Amazon S3 services to handle this small chunk of the file instead of a very big file. So this is, these are the advantages of having you know, a chunk based operation instead of playing with the whole file. So now let's see the very um, basics of the system design for uh, any of the file uploading services like Dropbox or Drive. So basically, as I explained, you will have a client. The client can be some application which is installed on your laptop or computer or your mobile phone, or it could be even web app, which you can open via browser. So now let's only concentrate, um, let's think that this client is somewhere installed on your phone or your laptop. So what are the very basic components in the client we should have to provide the seamless upload of the file or the syncing of the file between devices or between clients. So basically we have about four different components in the client itself. So now I have only represented one client over here. Maybe we'll have one more client, even more clients. Say, let's consider this is client number one, client number two, client number three. And all of these clients belong to the same user. Let's think that and proceed to our design. So now we have four different uh, co main components in the client and this is the folder in which has files and this client is actually actively monitoring the folder and the file ch uh, changes or updates happening uh, to the files inside the folder. And also here we have a cloud storage service. For, for the simplicity purpose, let's consider Amazon S3 um, or any other block store cloud storage services where it just saves the piece or the chunk of the file or any of the file. So now let's consider Amazon S3. And here is the messaging services. This is a queuing or asynchronous uh, uh, messaging services, which you can use um, RabbitMQ or ZeroMQ or Kafka. And then there's a sync service. I'm going to explain that. And there is a database and also cache. Now I've just represented one um, you know, DB over here. For now, you consider it as DB and also cache. And that's where our metadata will reside. Now, this system on a, over, uh, on a big picture, how it works, I'm going to explain it now. So now this is a client. We have indexer, chunker, watcher, and internal DB. The very first thing we want to learn is this is the folder. We have configured this client to 
uh, keep monitoring this particular folder or the files in the folder for any of the changes. So the very first time the folder will be empty well, and we have configured to monitor this folder, right? So this watcher will be uh, watching this particular folder. As soon as we put some files into this particular folder, this watcher will get notified that there are a couple of files which has been added to the folder. What this guy does is it notifies the chunker and indexer that there is some changes has happened to the folder and it also passes the path to the files to the chunker and indexer. What chunker does is, as the name indicates, it makes this file into multiple chunks and then it uploads into cloud S3. Before it doing so, it actually computes the hash of each chunks and that will be kind of unique identifier for the file and the chunk and then that will be uploaded and that hash along with the URL which we got back from the cloud services after uploading the chunk will be given back to the indexer. So, and then what indexer does is it receives um, the URL from the chunker and also the hash of the chunk and it will update that particular information in the internal DB against the file for which those hash belongs to. So now everything is good, right? So we have already uploaded the chunks of the file to the cloud SD. That means that what yeah, the complete file is already uploaded there. And we also, um, the, the indexer has saved the hashes and the URL to those chunks in the internal DB. Now everything is good. Now what we need to do is this indexer will notify the messaging services. Sir, here is the, you know, uh, file which have, which was um, we, we saw it newly on the folder and we have made it to these many chains and we have uploaded it there and all this information will be passed to the messaging service. It is just a queue. What this indexer will do is that message is, message will be sent to the messaging um, you know pipe or queue and that message will go here okay and then that message will be picked up by the sync service or synchronization services. What do we need to do so? Because initially I mentioned that there can be multiple clients which belong to the same file. As soon as we add a file into the folder, the same thing should be replicated on the other devices, right? So that's the main reason why indexer should notify the messaging services or synchronization services that there is some modification to the file has happened or there is an addition or deletion to the, the deletion of the file has happened. So that's when the synchronization service, what it does is it also updates the metadata um, into the metadata database, usually it is MySQL because we need it to be uh, consistent. The data of metadata, the data of the chains or the hashes uh, should be saved in a consistent man manner. So for now, we are, let's consider we're using MySQL DB and we update all of this information um, into the database. And also what you know, Sync service does is it sends back some of the messages back to the, um, you know, one more uh, queue, which is there in the messaging services. And those messages will be broadcasted to the other clients. So what happens is this guy send back this information of updates to the file back to all of the clients which belong to that particular user. So now these guys learned that there is some file addition happened to this folder. Now what we need to do is they also have obviously have the same kind of um, you know components here and the indexer will now fetch back those chunks from the cloud and rebuilds the file or syncs back the file um, into their devices so basically as soon as this messaging services sends the messages to these clients what happens is the indexer there will get back all of the strings of the file, say for example, these two files chunks, and then they inside the folder they will they will recreate the files. So they will have two different files, exactly similar copy of these folder and files will be replicated um, in other devices. Say I said this is device one, device two, and device two, right? Now the same copy of the files is replicated in all of the three devices. So that's how it works. Now I'm going to explain. Um, each of these components little uh, in depth, okay? So now let's learn about the messaging service. You might be thinking, why do we need a queue over here? Whenever we, we saw that some file updates are happening, 
why can't we just um, talk to the sync services synchronously? Why do we need asynchronous messaging service over here? I'll answer that question. So this is the uh, little bit more in-depth view of the messaging services. So, so you, can, you can think of the whole thing as a messaging services. It is basically, you know, n number of queues will be there inside it. So consider for the simplicity purpose, n number of clients, there'll be n number of uh, queues will be there, plus a uh, little more queues will be there for uh, different purpose. I'm going to explain that. So there are two types of queues in it. The first one is request queue, and the second one is response queues. Why do we need request and response queue? I'll explain that. So consider there are three clients, as we, as I mentioned earlier, the client number one, two, and three. We have a file, the client number one, or the, the client which is uh, looking at the file, saw that there is some changes happened to this file, or that file was newly added. So this guy will upload into the cloud service, and now it, it knows all the information about the chains and the metadata information, right? What this guy does is, he posts all the metadata information to the request queue. Why do we need a queue is, so this guy sends all of the metadata information to the request queue of the messaging services. Why do we need to do the asynchronous way is, because these devices might be connected to the internet or might not. We can't just always rely in a synchronous manner to send the updates about the files or sync the files, right? So we, we might be connected or we might not be connected. So we need a mechanism where these updates are kind of buffered and sent back to the server and um, you know uh, get the same information, uh, the metadata information about the files in a synchronous way. That's the only reason why we need uh, messaging uh, services or queues. So what this guy does is he posts the metadata information to request queue and that message will be staying here. And then this queue um, will be connected to the sync services. And then that message will be read by the sync service. And as I mentioned earlier, sync service will update the information into metadata uh, store that is uh, metadata DB and cache. That all happened. And also the sync service will broadcast back to all the other clients for the same user, which is um, uh, registered in RDB. What this guy does is, Whatever information which it received from the request queue, it rebroadcast all of those messages to the response queues. What happens is all the same metadata information will be sent to the response queue one, response queue two, response queue three. That information will be there inside this queue. Okay. So now, again, the queue helps you to uh, buffer these updates. If these two clients or these three clients are disconnected, now that message will stay in the queue, will never get lost. If it was a synchronous service, this guy should have called directly to this client by you know somewhere by HTTP. That's that doesn't work because these guys might be connected to the internet or to the server or not. So we put all of the metadata information to the response queue. And whenever we learn that these clients are connected to the servers, this metadata information will be delivered. As soon as these clients receive that metadata information, they know what to do with that. So they know the URL from where they should fetch those chains and then update their respective files. If they don't have the files, they will download the file and keep it uh, uh, synced. Otherwise, they will just download the chain which was updated from the client one and they update the file. And now let's learn what are the information which is stored in metadata. And also let's learn about metadata database and its own internal architecture to make it work seamless. At Dropbox, they call it as uh, edge store. This is just for your information, okay? So now, what are the information which we want to store in metadata database and why do we need it? So the first thing is metadata database or metadata information will actually contain the information about the chains and the hash, right? And also it contains the information of the file and its version because every chunk is kind of mapped to the different version of the file. So that information is also captured. And also along with that, it also contains the information about the user and what workspace they were working on uh, using any particular client. And um, now what kind of database we should be using for metadata store? So we can actually use RDBMS or NoSQL, irrespective of that, what we need importantly is the consistency. Because multiple clients will be working on the same file, right? So we definitely need a consistent data to be stored uh, in our metadata. Even though we're not actually saving the 
whole file content into the DB, the metadata information will itself represent the whole chunk or the file. So we need this metadata to be you know, consistent across uh, different clients. So we need a DB which acts as uh, which acts more consistent manner. So the very good thing about RDBMS is consistency comes inbuilt in the RDBMS. But whereas you can go for NoSQL, the only problem is it is eventual consistency that might screw up your file or chance. You might be wondering, okay, what happened to the file? Where, where is my version? I edited this and this is gone and this part is there and this part is gone. So all of these problems will come back if you use NoSQL. Or if you still want to use NoSQL, we have to have a layer on top of the NoSQL, which actually protects you or which actually gives you the consistent rights to the NoSQL because it is generally proven also that NoSQL scales well with um, you know more data as we store. But uh, nevertheless, Dropbox guys have managed to use MySQL and scale it um, to the you know existing user base about 10 to 15 million users and you know tons of millions of files um, of metadata information using MySQL itself. And I'm going to explain like how actually they did it. Um, as I mentioned, that is called as Edge Store, and that's architecture is over here. And uh, before um, learning about what is this, we have to also learn uh, the structure um, of information which we want to store. That is the actual metadata. And this is how it looks. So this actually is a kind of JSON um, which has these information, which has chunk ID, which has chunk order, and all the information about the object. Why do you need a chunk order? As I already mentioned, that if we break the file into multiple pieces, we should also know the order at which uh, the chunks should be you know, stitched back to get the original file. And also in the object information, we have the version number, whether it itself is a folder information or it's a file, and that information is captured in each folder, and also the file name, obviously, and the extension, size, and path, etc., etc. And also a little bit of information about the user is also captured over here, along with the device information. So now let's learn the uh, internal architecture of the metadata you know, service itself. That is not actually simple. In this diagram, you might think it is just a DB or you might have one more layer of caching or you have a separate caching component over here, but it's not actually easy. Now uh, let's go ahead and design using MySQL itself. When, um, when we think of RDBMS, it is kind of difficult to scale because to scale, we had to either do sharding or uh, what we can do, master slave and all that, right? And those are a little difficult. What Dropbox guys have done it is they have used sharding technique to distribute the data across multiple, you know, MySQL instances. They don't just have three MySQL database, they have like thousands of database over here. Not just the metadata information, they have all the other information also stored in using the edge store itself. So the very basic problem when you're using a multiple database, which is shared is, uh, so when we decide to use MySQL database to store the metadata uh, information, what are the problems we might face? Consider this system is not there, we just have database, which the metadata is shared across multiple database. So for developer, it is a significant burden where um, they have to keep on validating the schema and everything, right? It's kind of difficult task. And the next thing is whenever the database is filled and almost filled, we might need, we, we should be keep on adding more database to accompany more information or more data, metadata information, right? We might need to rebalance all of the data and reshard. This is kind of real pain. And the real big challenge is making these machines or managing these machines uh, to be always available like 24 seven, right? That these are like different difficult problem. To, to solve all of this problem, what Dropbox guys actually did it does is, they have, they kind of built a wrapper around this shattered database and um, they built APIs for the clients which um, actually interacts with the edge store or metadata store. So the clients, they have more of like Go or Python. Um, so they directly, instead of the clients directly interacting with the database, they started to interact with the edge wrapper, which kind of provided a ORM, that is object relational mapper, 
uh, which is kind of abstracted away, right? So the clients just call this, uses this ORM and just interact with the database, how easy it is, right? And they have an engine which kind of transforms all these ORMs and then interact with the MySQL, everything happens internally. And also, obviously, not every time when we want to fetch the file, um, we, we have to get this information about the chunks and everything, right? It's, it's, it's not a good idea to every time to fetch from the database. So we have to ha obviously have a cache in between. So if it didn't have the system, we would have had cache sub separated. First thing is we check in the cache, if it is not there, go back to the database and fetch it, right? So this system internally provided all of the services out of the box. So the developer need not to actually, um, you know, query, check in the cache and then, then query in the DB, but instead this edge wrapper itself kind of figured out that particular information is already available in the cache or not. If it is not there, then go to the engine, unwrap um, the, you know, ORM and get that um, all the information about the file which they are querying from the database. It is that convenient to have a wrapper, um, you know, around the MySQL. And also the advantage is uh, we never need to know about the underlying database. And also the edge store by default provided the transaction isolation between different queries the clients are actually making to the database. So that way we don't need to worry about having a lock or you know having a transaction uh, when we actually you know writing something into the meta store or uh, edge store or the metadata database, right? So it is kind of out of the box provided by the edge. Um, store in a different layer like edge wrapper and engine. So now let's talk about how to serve the data in scale. As we know, we have about more than 10 million users, you know, thinking that 10 million users, and we'll have more than 100 millions of the files, you know, best case. So how do we serve all of this data at scale faster, you know, lightning faster? How do we do that? So consider, considering that we are using Amazon S3, uh, Amazon S3 has more than about nine plus region presence, right? So think that they are uh, automatically distributed using CDN, Amazon's own CDN. Now we also need to make strategy based on the user's um, you know, home location. If the user is from, about, from Singapore, we have to place that file somewhere near to um, that location, that is Singapore. Amazon, I think, has our, in, in the Singapore itself, right? So we can actually upload all of these chunk files into the Singapore data, source, uh, data center itself so that whenever that user wants to sync that information, he can download it as fast as possible. And that is kind of solved because, um, you know, the Amazon itself is providing services. But when we are talking about metadata, because without metadata, no client can download anything. So metadata is actually the key information to download all of the file. So since we are the one who are storing all of this metadata information using edge store in MySQL, we have to actually place this information also much closer to the user. What we need to do is we have to either use some CDN services like Akamai, Fastly, or any of the CDN services, or we have to build our own CDN. How do we do that? First, we need to find out where our users are from. If there are like more users from Asia, we have to obviously need to place a data center or you know some servers near to Asia for Asian users. So how do we do that? We have to we can have we can actually use some kind of shallow learning um, methods like um, k-means clustering or some kind of clustering algorithms to find out the group of users or the clusters of the users from different region, and we have to place the server somewhere near to that region. So actually Dropbox kind of did the same. They actually clustered the users and they have placed the uh, you know, CDN or edge servers near to the user. What this information, uh, so what the servers contains is the metadata information because without metadata, we can't download any of the file from Amazon S3. Look at this first picture in which uh, this explains, say consider the metadata information and the data both are kind of stored in US region. If a user from Europe wants to download it, it is kind of taking about 700 milliseconds. But wherein if you decide to place the metadata server somewhere near Europe itself, a user can actually download the file or at least get the metadata information and contact the you know, actual Amazon S3 cloud within 330 milliseconds. That's how 
actually we have increased, uh, improved the latency by the factor of two. And that's the advantage of having CDN. So, so far we learned how exactly the file sharing and upload service works and its system design. Now, before I end the session, I just want to give some ideas on how we can actually implement the search engine, the full text search engine for our service. So we want to provide customized search feature from our clients, uh, client application, which, which um, our users have installed on our laptop or mobile phone. How do we do or what are the different ways we can achieve that? So I just want to throw some ideas on that. You guys read about it because there are a hell of um, you know, articles uh, about how do we implement search engine using machine learning and NLP, that is natural language processing. First thing is we have a lot of files with us. Before we actually upload these files into the cloud, we can do processing there in the client, but that is a very tedious process. We can't actually apply all of the different um, you know, machine learning um, you know, models or train them. So what instead we can do is uh, we can actually have a background running process or you know, scheduled job in our data warehouse or you know, in some data center where we actually look into all of the files which the users are uploading. And then in a weekly manner or bi-weekly manner, we can actually look into all of these files and extract the you know, text information from there. If it is all, uh, if all of the files our users are using are kind of text files, it is much easier to extract all of the text information to provide the search feature. But we know that people might be uploading, you know, text files, PDF images, or sometimes videos also. We, if, if you really want to provide some kind of search, if you look at the Dropbox or Evernote, they actually provide the image uh, text search also. How do we actually do about it? How do we actually do some kind of processing about it? So if it was a text file, we can easily extract all of the text and then we can do natural language processing and apply all of these different uh, techniques like tokenization, removing the stop words like you know articles B two and or something like that, and find all the synonyms using WordNet, which is a you know lexical dictionary which is available in the internet for free, and you know studying and lemmatization techniques to get the actual words and to understand the you know the actual context or uh, context of the you know sentence and give a better search uh, results. So if but but if but if the file was um, PDF image as our videos, how do we uh, do about it? So there are different strategies to that also. First thing is we can either uh, take the PDF files, take the uh, we can't actually we can pass the PDF file, but if we can't pass the PDF file, what we can do is take the image a screenshot and then convert into image. Now we have PDF and image both as an image form. And now what we can do use uh, what we can do is we have to you know extract the text textual information present inside those images. If it is PDF, definitely we are expected to have a lot of textual information there. But if it is image, we might have or we might not have. First thing is we might we should have a high level of uh, some kind of algorithms like machine learning algorithms um, which can detect whether there is a text information there in the image or not. We can actually use convolution neural network or CNNs to do that, which are very good in you know, image processing. And um, we can actually leverage optical character recognizers or OCRs to actually do that uh, task to figure out the letters in it. Um, what people actually use is if the image is kind of tilted, the texts are not always properly horizontally oriented, right? The, the text could be tilted in any direction. People these days are using deep um, neural networks to actually rotate the image so that we can actually extract the text part and then provide it to the OCR or convolution neural network to figure out what kind of textual information it is there and then get that textual information and then tag that particular position on the image um, and etc. So when the user searches, actually you can um, actually show image highlighted for the text also. You know, that's kind of way cooler feature you can provide in your document. Uh, too. And when, so basically we have to keep on looking at the signals from the user interaction and whenever the file updates happens, we need to keep on rerunning 
all of these processes uh, which I just discussed to build the search indexes, um, you know, up to date. I think I have covered most of the information which is needed to design the file sharing and file upload services. I think uh, uh, it's time to end this session. Uh, as usual, if you guys have any suggestion, please do send it to me. If you want me to make any of the videos on any of the system design, please uh, drop me a comment. I'll pick one of the system design for the next week. Um, thank you as usual. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. It actually encourages me to keep on producing more of the system design videos. And also please tell your friends uh, about the you know, channel and then make them subscribe too. Thanks a lot.